Hey, welcome everybody. Um, first, I want to just take one minute to say thank you to Molly Helen Kinberg, who made this grant that we're going to be talking about today possible. Um, it is in honor of, of her mother, Terry B. Helen. Uh, she and her mother traveled together very often, and she felt like uh, travel was a very formative experience for her. So today, we're going to hear from last summer's two winners, Isami and Sonali, about um, their application process, what, what made them want to travel and write about the topics that they chose, and also some of the places they went, and we're going to hear some excerpts of what they've written so far. So thanks again for coming, and I'm going to turn it over to Asami now. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, just a second. Um, my name is Isami McCowan. I am a junior in the college studying English. And I just wanted to quickly say thank you to the Kelly Writers House for this opportunity. It was one of the most incredible experiences I've had, and I felt so lucky to have been able to go on this journey. Um, this is a story that I felt moved to share for a long time, and having the resources to make it possible was really amazing, and I'm so grateful for the chance I had to do so. So just to give you guys a sense of what I did, I traveled to Japan this past summer to do research in my obachan, my grandmother's home country, for a story about her life and her experiences coming of age there. This entailed so many different things, but the most important parts of my collecting information was a chance to be reunited with extended family, great aunts, uncles, and cousins who I had never met before in my life and who my mom had not seen for over 20 years. So much of this precious information and so many of the stories that went into my writing about my grandmother's life as a young woman and an adult came from these conversations with these people, and that would not have been possible without taking this trip. We traveled to her hometowns where I got such an overwhelming historic sense of how the times have changed and as I explore Japan's incredible natural environments. I, don't, I know I don't have much time to talk, but, and I could show you hundreds of pictures, but I think that I'm just going to go into a piece of my writing. What resulted from this experience was a long form, nonfiction, memoir style story about Japan, my obachan, our relationship, and her impact on me. Okay, now I'm just going to read a short excerpt of my writing and show you guys some pictures. My Obachan and I never exchanged more than a few words at a time in the 20 years that I knew her. In fact, I don't think we ever even graduated far beyond, hello, how are you? It's good to see you, I missed you, how's school? During my adolescence, I was an island of one. I found it difficult to unsheathe myself from, my, from beyond my cocoon of introverted singularity, curiously and most especially among extended family members. Strangers and school friends were easy. They didn't expect much of anything from you. We simply existed in tangential relation to one another, wafting out of recollectable existence once we disappeared from visual periphery. Family was different. My mother's side of the family have always been spread out across the country, California, Florida, Michigan, Virginia at one point or another. Some years, I wouldn't see them at all. When my mother informed my brother and I that a trip had been canceled, I would let out a most shameful, most private breath of relief. Security at last, distance from a line I never quite learned how to tow correctly. Such is the conundrum of extended kin, not strangers, but apart. I found it impossible to bring myself to not only show them, but feel towards them the same level of unconditional love and verbal transparency I shared with my mother and my older brother. But still, a visit never passed where they failed to attempt to nudge me towards openness. The personal questions, the well-meaning hugs, the dutiful whispered comments to my mother that my shy aloofness was but a temporary roadblock to functioning adulthood. Aunts, uncles, cousins, they laid everything out in the open. But my obacha never once cracked. In all of the countless times I saw her, held brief and fragmented conversations with her, watched her eyes train somewhere off in the distant waves on family beach vacations. A moment never came where I heard her divulge even the smallest ounce of personal information. Quiet and introspective types aren't many in my family. 
I thought I was our unit's sole self-described emotional recluse, pointlessly hiding, when my juxtaposition was a neon fleck of Jackson Pollock on the canvas of a Rembrandt that otherwise made sense. The realization hit me like a truck. My Obachan was an island, and suddenly, in a most peculiar way, one became two. Ikuko. She emerged into this world on an island of many, the youngest of eight children, born to Satoru and Kua Kutsuna Hayakawa. As a child, I am told she was quiet but precocious, a wallflower whose presence bloomed through the windows and doors and storefronts and in the street cracks of Nagoya until the entire city was her garden. When she was 15, her parents sent her to work. One thing I'm certain of, if I could ask her now, I know that she would say that nothing was the same after 1953. She had left the train station she was working at and taken up work cleaning hotel rooms, back into the routine of the everyday after falling in and out of love. I wonder if she felt grown up at 25. I wonder if I will and what advice she would have had for me in another life for navigating the difficult train of this point in life. What happened next is only the kind of thing you see in literature. None of us who came after her really knew the exact story of how it happened, but I imagine it went something like this. Prepare to go home and be rid of work troubles for the day, Ikuko hangs up her worn apron and shuffles around in a back room of the hotel in search of her bag. Perhaps she finds it immediately, or maybe it takes a bit of rifling around. But just as she does, at the exact moment she's prepared to walk out of the door, the front desk bell rings. A moment. Her shift is over. She's tired, her hands hurt, and she's desperate to get the smell of cleaning chemicals out of her hair. Perhaps she's curt. Perhaps if she's curt, whoever it is will disappear quickly. She swings the door open, and her eyes land on him. A moment suspended in time. What is there to say about those two? From every story I've heard, they existed in reaction to one another, quite like oil and water, fire and ice. Improbable, nonsensical, but yet still brought together by a sliver of an odd. His name was Frank, an American soldier, a black man, a vivacious, loud, infuriatingly carefree American in a quiet hotel in a small town in Japan at closing time, stood opposite a woman who was his opposite but for whom suddenly staying at work for another hour or another lifetime didn't seem so bad. I saw her in the gardens. The first we arrived to, Tokyo's Imperial Palace. The heat washed over my mother and I as we trekked through the winding pathways in search of the relief offered by a billowing tree or the small overhang of a restroom. It's difficult to describe exactly what I felt as I moved through the greenery then under the sun. 2019, the edge of 50 years separating me from the last time Ukuko was in my place. She likely arrived by train from Nagoya, the last home she knew in her mother country. My thoughts consumed me, but it felt wrong to voice them to anyone in the moment. Who could listen aloud and understand the tangled web that cascaded over me? Perhaps she heard. Wherever she was, perhaps she felt the weight of the homecoming tightening in her chest as I did so thoroughly. Although this was my first time in Japan, I could not shake the feeling, no matter how desperately I tried, that I was back. That somehow, geography had brought us closer than we were when we sat by each other all those times as she watched me grow up. The pressing weight of absence and presence closing in. What did she think of these gardens, I asked myself. Did it burgeon a sense of pride in her history, in the geographical home that by some chance of nature she was bound to? Did she feel the air in Japan settle on her skin differently than an American breeze? I certainly felt that something had altered itself. Life in parallel, my obachan and I, fragmented cloths, overlaid upon <clears throat> one another once again, pieced back together as I returned to her home, but with a loose thread somewhere or other, a gap that eternally hung slightly open, the emptiness holding tight the things that I would never know. We both simply prefer to listen rather than to talk. And when two of that same peculiar attribute come together, there is harmony in the metronomic beats of silence, something shared and unspoken, lived but unheard. Connected by our kinship of bloodlinked womanhood, not by long conversations, but rather in the perspective that she passed down to me. My mother, outspoken, an open book with loud laughter and dance, and surrounded by friends, would often say that Obachan's traits skipped a generation omitting her as if a skipping stone in its brief midair flight and broke the water surface as it floated down carefully, carefully, delicately, and fatefully to me. Perhaps it is this that connects us, not alike in appearance or experience, but something even more personal, more central. I often feel as though I watch the world with her eyes. 
the wayward daughters, a matriarchal empire crafted carefully by Tuan, the wind of passing generations only furthered the quiet harmony built then. The story of two homes fashioned into one, spools of thread weaving together the fabric of divergent place and time. I think of how it has come to define us, our family, me and her. The quiet adventure, the breathing island that ebbs and flows with the change of the times, our pain contained amongst ourselves. Messages in bottles set out to sea, the unadmitted half-hearted corkscrew left only partially secured so that maybe someone will find the things we wish we could say one day and from, that, and from them set out on a journey of their own <clears throat> to go from the things they've come to know. This is what I hoped I was doing as I moved through Japan, finding her words in the air, etched into the corridors of narrow streets, the one in which she paved her way on, and small restaurants erected in her coming of age, in the grand museums and palaces of leaders come and gone, her island steady on in the sea. <clears throat> Home, I felt it in a strange way as I moved through Japan, on tired feet and busy train terminals by bicycle, had leaning against the quiet windows of Shinkansen's, I felt something of her, a watch on Ikuko. It wasn't quite a presence in the way I often hear people speak fondly of it, but instead some sort of breathing memory. It exhaled steadily, floating with and through me. I often think that life is quite cinematic, like I am living in a movie and that some anonymous audience somewhere is watching in a quiet theater outside of town. In Kyoto, I wondered what it would have looked like if a film reel of my own time there and one of Ikuko's were played in parallel that I might find that we saw the idyllic Japanese city, rich with centuries of history and holding tight to, say, to something quite inexplicably wonderful in the same way. We shared in our love for peace and for beautiful things found in the mundane. I saw this in the streets of Kyoto, in the small neighborhood where Ikuko herself lived for a time in her 20s, the decade of constant change within a city defined by tradition, a breathing garden whose roots firmly sat upon the foundation of Japanese history. To be there at 20, for those like her and I, was to be suspended in the sublime joy that could only exist in such a place, one where life beyond the city limits fades out of remembrance as time itself seems to evaporate and an intangible feeling of contentment takes its place. What does one do when they believe the clock has stopped ticking? Perhaps we dream. Those unkept promises that offer us no guarantee, but which we grasp to so tightly, because we know they are the only ways of realizing those hopes that we could never dare say aloud. They are so intimately tied to us, within us, born from the desires that we have built into who we are. I'm told that Yukuko often dreamed in her young adulthood of what her life might turn out to be. I think that I share that with her. I always have. I dream of peace. I will not make things simpler, neater, and prettier by saying that I dream of this abstractly. It is constantly accompanied with all the intricate specifications of things that must happen, benchmarks and goals, and people and places I must meet to guarantee the kind of carefully orchestrated tranquility that only those whose heads lie so frequently in the clouds that precipitation sighs a constant caress on their cheeks seem to know. The kind that somewhere, in some unspoken depth in my heart, I know can never be achieved, and paradoxically, that all of the wonder within me all of the hope would be destroyed if I ever stopped searching for it. For me, peace and order must coexist. My mother often jokes that this is the Japanese in me, these two supposed mutually exclusive requirements for the settled life that I saw so delicately woven into the earth, the geography and the architecture of Japan, so seamless that it felt divinely ordained in nature. Local bus lines that seem to eternally prefer five minutes early to a second late, the gold-plated temple of Kinkakuji settled so squarely in the middle of a shallow body of water that it seemed to be measured by the centimeter. The calm but disquieting resignation, the self-imposed seclusion, would never be acknowledged as anything more than a decision. My obachan was very much the same. Ever neat, ever put together, her kitchen and bedroom, her entire house for that matter, was always immaculate. Cleaning is not often something we think of as symptomatic of a greater unknown. Especially in the elderly, I think that many of us are afraid to admit that we don't give a second thought to our tidy grandmothers, most certainly those quite old in age, because we liken ourselves to be grateful that they at least have something to keep them busy when we cannot ourselves be there. For Ikoko, I think the order was peace by proxy. It was a way of getting close to, closer to solace so that there would be nothing to worry about when she retreated into her thoughts, into a world in which she could dream. Of what specifically, I am unsure. I could never be. 
Those of us so invested in our own thoughts build complex universes. They are populated with other people, but only ever visited by us as the creators. So carefully layered, inscribed with rich detail, rich with desire and aspiration. Our identity distilled into an unmarked road, which leads to a place only we could ever know. But there is one thing to be unequivocally sure of. The destination, by some measure or other, leads to peace. It is what she dreamt of for herself, for us all. She often walks that unmarked road in my own quiet world. I met her there in Kyoto. I found it, I think I would have, I'd have said when we met somewhere in the middle. There is a concept that stems from Japan's high-end period called mano no aware, literally translating to the pathos of things. It rolls off the tongue and into the waiting air a sensitivity to ephemera. It is a recognition of what we cower, often cower at the object of recollecting the impermanence in everything, the subtle transience of life's courses, the versions of ourselves that we leave behind, the endings come and gone, the eventual departures we will bid to each place we once called home, the lasting pain that we may carry so deeply and so privately long after such things have passed, <laughs> the overcoming surge of emotion released like a held breath, the moments we only feel comfortable acknowledging once we believe that everybody else has forgotten. There's a gentle sadness in all of us about these moments we feel in reaction to the temporariness of all that which we are, which we see, and which we dream of, an acceptance of the opportunities we will inevitably miss, of living those peculiar moments that feel like memories in real time, as if they're over long before they've begun. Still, a quiet beauty course is in the midst. Those things that we know cannot last are yet still things, if just for a brief and shining glimpse that were lived, seen, and felt. Such is the paradoxical magic in discovery, that transcendent moment in which you embrace the subdued pain of seeing for the first time, without pretense or fear of regret, that which you have lost. You see it in its glory, in those times that it was most spectacularly alive, and marvel at the extraordinary advent that there was ever even a moment that you stood as witness. <clears throat> Four years ago today, my Obachan left me. With the weight of all that I've learned, all that I've seen, I know now what I would say to her to fill the quiet that we once shared. Aishite mas aitai, watashi wa anata gadareda ka wakarimas. I love you, I miss you, and I see you as you are. Um, thank you so much. Hi, um, my name is Sonali. Uh, I'm a sophomore studying economics and creative writing. And um, I'm really grateful to the Helen Travel and Research Grant um, for the project that I was able to do last summer. So yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the background of what I did. So, um, the population that I was studying is called Adivasis. They um, 
are called the that this is a term that refers to the indigenous people of India. So this is a population of about um, 84 million people, 8% of India's population. Uh, I wanted to go and study Adivasis um, in the state of Gujarat in India because that's the state where my family is originally from. And so the language that's spoken there called Gujarati is my mother tongue. Um, and so Adivasis kind of have uh, a long, violent history of marginalization. Um, so over 95% of them live in rural areas, and more than half depend on forest produce for their livelihood. Um, and so their land has been very vulnerable to economic exploitation, and they're one of the most disadvantaged socioeconomic groups in India. Um, they face a lot of discrimination um, and violence in mainstream Indian society. So. Um, they are a population that has been fighting to retain their social and economic identity. So my inspiration for um, you know, applying for this grant is that I'm very passionate about social justice causes in India. Um, I had briefly encountered uh, these tribal and indigenous groups in Gujarat before, and I wanted to deepen my experience. Um, so I really wanted to document the experiences and the stories uh, of these people. And so this grant kind of represented to me an opportunity to go out of my comfort zone, to go live in rural India and um, like pursue my passion. So my proposal was to interview, listen, and record the stories of Adivasis in the district um, Valsad in Gujarat. So this is the state in India, and then the little yellow and like the um, blue state is the district where I went to. So I spent three weeks staying in a residential school for tribal or indigenous girls. Um, and yeah, so just kind of a visual. I was literally going to households, houses that look like this, like villages, and chatting with villagers for about like like 30 minutes or so, and just trying to um, uh, ask these probing questions to spark a dialogue so I could get a sense of their personal experiences. So um, I asked questions about all these different aspects of their lives, and this resulted in 30 interviews, like 100 individuals, and like a lot of stories. So yeah, I'll um, get to my writing. My writing as a result of this project is a mix of creative nonfiction and fiction. My first piece is a personal essay describing my experience of nature while living at the Cady School, a residential institution for tribal girls. The piece is titled Mangoes and Monsoons. You or I could look at that tree and spot maybe two or three mangoes, but ask any of these girls and they could see about 20, a quote from Rahubai, a teacher at the Cady School. Nestled in the rural farmlands of Dharampur district, Gujarat, you'll find the yellow and pink painted concrete walls of the Kedi school. It is home to about 30 girls, as well as several teachers and staff. Calling Kedi a school is a misnomer. Rather, the institution houses a community. I immediately fell in love with the Kedi community because of the students and teachers' overt affection and warmth. After just a few days, girls would crowd around me and ask about America, or gather around me in my bed at night and giggle about my fear of bugs, or pull me into their glass rooms so I could play games with them. We played games to improve their English and my Gujarati. When I came to Kedi, I could barely have a conversation in my native tongue. I learned that many girls worried about being married after their graduation, because they had aspirations to graduate from college and become employed. We showed each other a lens to a different part of the world. I learned that central to their lives, regardless of their caste or religion, was their relationship with nature. I realized that the cushioned, urban, elite South Mumbai life that I'd always experienced with my family in India lacked the most essential element of Indian rural life, nature. Especially to Adivasis, nature is a source of habitation, income, sustenance, beauty, and religion. Some Adivasi tribes worship deities of rivers, animals, rain, and the sun. Behind the school building is a cow shed, fields for growing vegetables, and a mango orchard. While Kedi often has electricity blackouts and water shortages, the shortcomings of living further away from urban, centralized sources of energy, the girls lived incredibly synchronized with nature. There is an indescribable fluidity and deafness to their movements when they agilely soughed the fields outside of their school, when they caressed and milked the cows, when they instantly eyed the ripest mangoes, scrambled up the trees to pluck them, and nimbly leaped down. 
when they shouldered large pots and buckets to transport water and food, when they gathered and peeled vegetables before I'd even picked up the knife. The teachers at the school, some of whom were also Adivasi, told me that the girls' greatest strength was their intuition, a feature that arises from their affinity with nature. On one of our trips, three girls, Manju, Shito, and Gita stayed overnight with me for a few days in a village where we were conducting interviews. We stayed at the home of one of, the, of, one of Gedi's teachers, Amit Bai. His home was kacha, or raw, meaning that it was made of mud and wooden sticks, a classic village home. The village also had no electricity at the time, and so in the evening we crowded by candlelight, and Gita told me how to make rotis. The four of us slept next to each other that night, on a bed made of woven ropes similar to a hammock. Amitbai's home had no door, so we slept in a room with two walls that opened straight into the night. I closed my eyes, listening to the sound of nature sleeping, of the soft thrum of crickets chirping, the gentle ble breeze that ruffled trees' leaves, and the occasional grunt of cows while they padded around in their shed. There was one day when, for about 30 straight minutes, the sky poured down rain mercilessly, as if preparing us for the relentless monsoons later that summer. The girls and I raced out into the courtyard, barefoot, and danced, drenching ourselves. And I remember that one of the teachers, Rahubai, plunged his hands into the mud and smeared it over his face, letting the rain soak him clean. He laughed and said to us, isn't it beautiful? Gesturing to the mud caked on his face and hands. Had we not been in Kedi, where day by day, I was becoming increasingly more enchanted and astounded by nature, I would have thought he was crazy. Looking at Rahubai's muddy face, my relatives from Mumbai would have reeled in disgust. But feeling the water pour down my face, my feet sinking into the rich mud, I could feel it too. It was as if the green around us became brighter, fresher, like it was rejoicing in the rain as well. We were intoxicated by nature's song, nature's power, by the insatiable desire to become closer and more intimately consumed by nature's touch. My next piece is Creative Fiction, inspired by Manju, one of the three girls who became my closest friends. Manju woke up to her parents' angry voices. Usually, she woke up at dawn anyways to go check on the cows and seed the fields, but her eyes flickered open about an hour earlier today. She slowly, quietly rolled off the blanket spread across the floor of her family's kacha hut and folded the frayed quilt, tucking it into the shelf under the stained mirror. Silently, she padded over to the doorless threshold and peered over at her parents standing by the cow shed, her mother clutch clutching a straw jaru and gesturing with it emphatically, while her father held two steel pails of fresh milk. Her father was saying that Manju wasn't going to go back to school. Sudden, her mother was shaking her head, her face reddening, insisting that Manju finish high school. Suddenly, Manju's father grabbed her mother's shoulders, clenching her arms so tightly that Manju could see her mother's face slowly paling. Manju shrank back into the shadows of their hut, realization sinking in. He had already started drinking. She heard her father's next words anyways, even though she didn't want to. If you dare give that girl hope that she'll finish school, I will make sure you never say another word to her. Her parents were now walking back towards her, her mother's lips so tightly pressed together they were white. Manju hurried to the woodpile to gather food and busied herself with making breakfast. The heat was so much today that even Manju's sun-weathered skin shined with sweat. She harvested the rice crop quickly and carefully, checking for the firmness in the flour before severing the roots. Her father had threatened her earlier, saying that if she didn't harvest enough crop during the day, then she wouldn't go back to school. So she worked as fast as she could. She paused, listening. She heard it again, rustling far off in the distance. Her pulse quickened with anticipation. She hurried to the nearby stream, rinsed her muddy feet, and splashed her face with the cool water. Adjusting her dupatta and fanning her face slightly, she waited for him to emerge from the field. Tall, thin, and clad in a worn white shirt and loose black shorts, he stepped out from the field with two fistfuls of mangoes and a knife, grinning widely. Manju sat down by the stream and gestured for him to join her. He was humming and cheerfully began peeling a mango, handing Manju the glistening, juicy slices. They sat side by side, his thin legs just barely touching her trailing dupatta. Are you ready? she asked him, barely concealing the eagerness in her voice. Ask away, he said, smiling as he stuffed his mouth stuffed his mouth with a mango slice. Why is milk white? 
She had thought of the question months ago, suddenly, when she was carrying a pail of milk and spilled some into the stream, watching its whiteness diluted by the water. She wondered about what created color then. Why was water clear? But she had to choose her questions carefully, because he didn't have enough time to answer all of them. They didn't have enough time. So she reviewed her list of questions every day, thoughtfully picking the one that she most wanted answered. Of course, the more questions that he answered, the more questions she wanted to ask him, which only made her miss school more. But she'd take what she could, what little time with him that she had. It was the next best thing to school. He never raised his eyebrows or expressed surprise about her questions. He would just start explaining and make sure that she understood him. He didn't assume that she knew fancy words, but explained them simplistically. He understood how, although she brimmed with curiosity and a burning desire to learn, she had to suppress herself because of her father. He was explaining waves of light to her when she felt the evening breeze and noticed an orange smear beginning to make its way across the sky. She glanced around and then touched his arm. He stopped talking about visible light and looked at her, quiet. Is it time? She nodded. He leapt up, grabbing the rest of the mangoes and tucked the knife into his pocket. Tomorrow, he said, and Manju nodded. A few moments later, he had disappeared into the field. The sweat had dried into caked patterns along Manju's arms as she headed back home to make dinner. She thought of how at school, her arms were not busy carrying crops, but books. Her hands were not plucking rice and grain, but scrawling a pencil across paper. She was very good at writing. Her teachers had told her she was the best. They told her that if she continued through high school, they would sponsor her college education. But Manju knew she would never go to college. Her father would not let her go. She knew her teachers would be disappointed. After dinner, Manju scrubbed the pots and pans and swept the floor. She used her dupatta to dust the interior of her home, wary of her father, who crouched outside with a bottle at hand. But it seemed, it seemed as if the storms had calmed for today. She pulled out her folded blanket and spread it, across the, spread it over the floor. She stared into the darkness of her doorway, st straight into the night. She thought about its navy hue, mulling over what she'd learned about today. She wondered for a moment what her friends had done at school that day, if they had remembered her, if they'd already learned about colors and waves and light, if they knew the answers to all the questions she wanted to ask. She thought about what questions she would ask tomorrow. Her mother saw Manju's eyes open and chastised her for staying awake. Go to sleep, she said. You have to wake up early again tomorrow. Manju closed her eyes. She was tired, but wouldn't fall asleep for a while. So now we have a chance to ask them some questions. Thank you both for sharing those beautiful pieces with us. Who has a question, or one or both? Um, I'm assuming that both of you guys had uh, conducted interviews in other languages. How did you go about translating, transcribing, recording those interviews? Um, I Most of the interviews that I conducted were with like extended family members who I hadn't seen for a long time. But I kind of took a more informal approach in that sense because I had some family members who were bilingual, and although like it was a little bit of a struggle, like it just felt like more personal, especially because some of them were elderly, and I don't think they would have felt comfortable um, speaking to strangers, or so they told me. So we had like other family members who were bilingual just try to help us translate. Yeah, um, so for me, uh, Gujarati is a language that was spoken in the state, and so my Gujarati was really bad, so I can understand it, but when I speak it, it's pretty broken. So to ask the interview questions is gonna be a challenge. So actually, girls from the school um, came with me, and the problem is that these different tribes don't actually speak the state language, they have their own dialects. So since the girls were also like indigenous, they were also tribal, they would come with me on the interviews. I would say the question in my like bad Gujarati, they would translate it into the tribal dialect and then the villagers would respond and the girls wrote down their responses in Gujarati and then that was then translated into English. So it was like a communication barrier, but um, we like were able to manage it. Thank you. 
So um, I have a question uh, for Sonali. What, how did you meet the girl you wrote about? Was she back at school? Um, and is she still in school? Yeah, um, so uh, the girl that I met, Manju, um, is, she was in school at the time that I like met her. Um, but her story, like this fictional piece I wrote, there's a lot of like facts in it, like the background with her father, that's factual drawn from other girls' stories as well. I wrote it about Manju though. Um, and so Manju is at school and I believe that her family will let her, um, she wants to be part of like the police force. So I think they'll let her do it. But there were a lot of other girls who parents would come and just take their kids out and um, get them like married. Um, so yeah, Manju specifically, I hope will be able to graduate, but some of the other girls won't be able to. And then to follow up, um, Asami, do you, was there one story about your grandmother when she was young that just really opened a door for you or, um, or that made you laugh or just really created a, a new bond mm -hmm. with her? I think um, there were a lot of good ones. I think that the one that I spoke about today where the first time that she met my grandfather was like, that was story like I had not heard that story before like she was like very private about their relationship so we didn't really hear that much so that story was very interesting and then hearing about like previous times that she had like fallen in love before hearing that from her sister my great aunt were just so interesting because since she was such a private person, like she held all of her cards so close to her chest all the time, it was like very cool to see her like kind of in a more vulnerable light from like people who knew her much better. Yeah. Hey, thanks guys, both of you. So Asani, you talked about feeling like relief being able mm. to distance yourself from your family and then like, sorry, throughout this process you like deepened your relationship with your grandmother and I was wondering how your relationship with the rest of your family was deepened by your experiences, especially it sounds like in traveling with your parents while you were in Japan. Right, so I traveled to Japan with my mom um, and I think that like I've always had a strong relationship with my mom but I think that the experience itself did kind of open me up more to like my extended family, especially on my mom and my obachan side, because like we're not like super close as a family. That's just kind of how we operate. Like we're kind of fragmented, but like hearing my aunts and my uncles like their stories of like when they were growing up and like it was kind of like a rough time because my obachan and my grandpa like fought a lot. So just kind of like hearing those stories, I think, just kind of showed me who they are because I feel like we often see like our grandparents and our aunts and our uncles as only in those roles and we don't really hear the stories of like before they were grandparents or like aunts or uncles. So I think just like really seeing someone's story like from start to finish can help you get to know them a lot better and it did for me. Uh, hi, so this is a question for both of you guys. Uh, do you guys plan on going back and like, um, like to where you guys went and then like looking over the writing, like trying to write more and like revisit some of the places? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I uh, was like, I didn't foresee that I would go and I would actually like make friends and like become so close with the people who I lived with. Um, so I still keep in touch with them. Um, it's hard because um, only like one of the teachers has like a phone so like that's like how I try to keep in touch but I definitely want to go back um, I think that uh, the school where I was staying is a really interesting place because they have this goal of educating girls um, because they want um, they've identified that if you educate like moms and like a family then their children will be educated so it's about creating values in a generation that will subsequently create those values in like their kids so i think that model of like the institution is super fascinating and i want to go back and keep like documenting and seeing like the progress and like how like the different girls are passing on what they've learned to like their families 
Um, I definitely feel like a lot of similar sentiments. Like I would absolutely love to go back to Japan. It's probably like it was my favorite trip that I've ever been on before. Like it was just incredible to kind of like see how much it had changed from like the pictures that I saw because I was born in Singapore and my family traveled around Asia for a while until I was like about four years old and we moved to the States. So just being able to continue seeing how much the country has changed and also go back and see my family members like my cousin Ibuki is the same age as me like he's also 20 and he's I think studying abroad in Canada soon so just being able to really keep in touch with him would be amazing. So Sonali, you mentioned that you were like an econ and a creative writing major, and mm -hmm. I was wondering how combining a very like right brain and a very left brain mm -hmm. discipline influenced your creative process cumulatively. Yeah. Um, so I think that um, I was considering this research kind of to be twofold. I wanted a writing project to come out of it, um, and I, you know, wanted to produce creative work, and I also wanted it to be research in the sense that. It was um, like a study, like uh, surveying people and collecting data, because um, as like an econ major, I'm really interested in especially healthcare for um, people. Actually, it's really interesting for these Adivasi people. They often use um, healthcare remedies that are natural. So like if they're very sick or something, they'll just get like extracts from trees and like plants and they'll have that. So um, healthcare and um, natural remedies is something that I want to study um, and like produce and like uh, produce research from data that I collect. So yeah, I wanted to make this um, trip both about documentation and um, connecting with people um, and using, you know, writing about uh, their experiences creatively in forms of narrative and fiction. But I also do hope to use all this like data that I collected from interviews um, and prepare a type of study that I hope that I can go and like continue in the future. Okay, well, I think we can wrap up unless there's anything that either of you would like to share with us in addition to what you've already shared. Um, I think both pieces, well, all three pieces were really beautifully written and a joy to hear, and I'm so glad that we were able to help you make these trips. Um, and for any of you in the room that are uh, underclassmen, if you want to apply this year, we'll be announcing the Halley Grant very soon, and I think applications will be due at the end of spring break. So. I'd like to just thank you both again um, for, for sharing with us. A little round of applause. <laughs> and thank you all for coming. Thank you. <laughs>